So um, my first question is about the beginning of your career. You were a geek, you were loving love films and stuff, and you crossed the line. You become someone who made films loved by a lot of people. How is it to cross the line to be a part of this? Absolutely wonderful, but I do look forward to the day crossing the line again and just going back to watching things. Yeah, yeah there's... I only got here because I watched everything. You know, when I was a kid, I watched every TV show I could, went to all the movies and whatnot. Never dreamed that I would do it, but just watched that shit because I was one of those kids. I didn't play sports and shit. I watched movies and TV. So to be able to, like, one day do it, I mean, I guess it was a foregone conclusion I would at least try. After seeing Richard Linklater's movie Slacker, it was like, well, other people are trying this. Maybe I can be one of these indie filmmakers. And we tried, and boy, it worked in the first try. I doubt if, like, I'd had to do it three times, I would have had as much passion or wherewithal. But, like, first time out the gate, it happened. And brought us into a wonderful world where for the last 20 years, I've gotten to be like, uh, I want to make a story where this fucking happens. And suddenly, boom, they give me money to do it and stuff. But at the same time, it's like, there's something real pure and wonderful about being an audience member. You know, like most, uh, for the last 20 years, now that I've seen behind the curtain and whatnot, and you see how the sausage is made, the, the same wonder that came with being the person that just watched movies when I was a kid doesn't exist anymore. Until like recently, when I was in London, I went over to, to the episode seven set. It was the first time, like I'm serious, this is the first time I felt something like that in a long time where all that bullshit of like, I'm a filmmaker and I'm Kevin Smith and, and I've seen how movies are made, so movies are movies went away and suddenly I was just fan again. Suddenly I was just a consumer or viewer or the audience. And so felt amazing to divest oneself of all sorts of like, um, where am I in this? You know what I'm saying? As a filmmaker, you're so fucking arrogant. You insert yourself into every situation. All, all artists are like that. You know, an artist, I don't care if you're an actor, actress, director, uh, writer, blogger, whoever the fuck, they're all this type of person. Normal person walks into a room and sees a bucket of apples on a table and they go, okay, that must be for somebody. And they don't touch it. An artist walks in a room and says, somebody left me apples and they immediately start fucking taking. We're just very arrogant people. So they're, even though there are movies made that you have nothing to do with, you still measure yourself against them somehow because you are a filmmaker, supposedly. So I look forward to the day where I ain't a filmmaker anymore. I can just go back to kicking back and watching other people's shit. That's why I stand up on stage and tell people, like, go make a movie, go make a movie. You could do this, you could do this. Because at the end of the day, I will kick back and want to watch something. Like, I'm going to be, I know I will go back to being just a consumer at one point. So I, I hope there's a lot of things that I want to consume, a lot of stories that I want to see told. Right now, it just makes sense to make them, though, because nobody's going to make the movies that I want to see. Nobody's going to make fucking Tusk, Clerks, none of this shit. So, while I've got them in me, I might as well do it. But I know it's finite. There's a guff. And when it's empty, you push back and walk away. And I thought I was. Like, 2011, after Red State, I was like, I'm done making films. I'll make Clerks 3, and then that's it. And then this podcast, talking about Tusk, suddenly reinvigorated me, where I felt the same thing I felt about making Clerks. Like, if I don't make this, nobody's going to make this. And I really want to see this, so fuck it, I'll make it. And that led to another and to another. So right now, there's this kind of what was a dying ember is like, oh shit, I like this. This is fun again. Because it's informed by the podcasts now. So that validates the last seven years of my life where I'm like, now I'm making all these podcasts because I can turn them into movies and stuff. But um, it's it, obviously make and pretend for a living and they give you money to do it is one of the greatest jobs in the world and stuff. But there's something nice about walking into, into a theater, watching it, and having no personal agenda beyond like, did I like it or didn't I like it? So I look forward to getting back to that too, because it paved the way for all this. Yesterday you were present to Batman Dark Knight Returns. Yes. Great adaptation from the. Uh, and there were so many Twitter. people there, which was yeah. cool. Yeah. yeah, I was happy with that. It uh, reminds uh, me of Batman Mask of the Phantasm of Bruce Tim, who mm. is uh, also a producer in uh, yesterday. Um, and I asked myself, it's if the cartoon of Bat the, the Batman uh, darker and better than the movies, what is your opinion? Of Dark Knight Returns, the movie? And generally, the cartoons of Batman is better. Better than all feature versions. Movies. Absolutely, I would agree with that hands down. Um, uh, the Batman animated series was absolutely brilliant. 
they have more time to tell the story. Uh, they're not they're not going like we got two two hours to tell an entire Batman story and get people in and get them out and then do it again. You know, with a TV show, you get to leisurely. You get to do an episode about Scarecrow, an episode about Joker, an episode that has no villains in it, just more about Bruce himself. So they get to tell more elegant stories, far more elegant storytelling. Most people, most adults, never realize that those stories were almost for them more than kids. You watch the Batman animated series, you can definitely watch it with a child, but it works on an absolute adult level. So it's a shame it never broke through to the same people that are willing to go see the Chris Nolan Batman movies or something. Um, the Dark Knight Returns, this adaptation they did of Frank Miller's book, I think is splendid. I think it's. I, I don't think anyone will ever make a better Batman, Superman, anything. And I love Zack, and I think his movie's going to be great, but... How can you fucking beat that? They were animated. They could do whatever the fuck they want, man. And they took a fight sequence in the book that was only like two pages and turned it into something even bigger, something better. So right now, like, I, they've got a high bar to reach for, for, as far as I'm concerned, for the Batman versus Superman movie because the Dark Knight Returns cartoon was so splendidly done. It's, in general, it's better for you and um, the uh, mask kind of uh, Red Hood. The animated movies, the Red Hood, also the Bruce Team. You you meet Bruce Team? I have met Bruce Tim. He's been on. Uh, I do a podcast called Fat Man on Batman, where all I do is sit down and talk to people about Batman. Some people have worked in the cartoon, the animated series. Some people have worked on the comic book version. Some people have worked on the video games. So I've spoken to like Grant Morrison. I've spoken to Neil Adams, Denny O'Neill. I've spoken to Paul Dini, Bruce Tim. We did at San Diego Comic Con. I think it was two years ago. We did them live in front of everybody. Um, very cool guy. And then I was just on a panel with him recently in New York for like Batman's 75th birthday. So I've gotten to speak to a lot of these people who've worked on it. And when, when you listen to that, if you ever listen to that podcast, Fat Man on Batman, it's not so much a podcast about Batman as it is about people who change everything about their lives just to like work on that character. Like, because we do it as a, this is your life, and they take us from the beginning when they were born and like where they grew up and their parents and their life all the way to how they got to work on the character eventually. And it's a really inspiring podcast because you hear from a bunch of people that found their passion in this bizarre character that they don't own or anything, but would move everything so much so that they're like, I want to work on this character and change their life to do so. So I, if you've never heard it, listen to that podcast. If you're a remotely fan of Batman, particularly the animated series, because we've had so many people from the animated series on, including the voice actors as well. Like Kevin Conroy, he did a whole episode. Um, God, who else? Uh, Tara did an episode. Also, uh, voice of Harley Quinn, Arlene Sorkin did an episode. Yeah. So we've done a lot of those. Mark Hamill. And which one? Mark Hamill. For the Joker. Mark Hamill, and of course Sorry, Mark, Mark Hamill. Hamill. The for the uh, he did a two-parter, and probably two of the best episodes of that podcast ever, because he talks about Star Wars a little, little bit, and there was this was long before Episode Seven was in, on the horizon; didn't even exist. But what he talked about more was everything, his entire life, like all the jobs he had prior to Luke Skywalker. He's a big Broadway nerd. He's a big cartoon nerd, big TV nerd, huge comic book nerd. And he speaks like you normally you see like I start talking, blah, blah, blah. Mark is the kind of guy where I sit down and I'm like, how are you? And then I could just sit there for about 20 minutes because <laughs> he's a, a bona fide entertaining speaker. So those episodes, yes, the Mark Hamill one's definitely worth And he does the Joker voice and stuff. It's really, really good. Okay, um, I would like to know why you changed uh, from uh, these uh, comedy movies into make horror films. I, I did. I felt like I'd done as much with comedy as I, I could or was interested in at the moment. And like when you do some one thing long enough, you know, every once in a while you want to switch it up. The movies I grew up watching um, were like David Cronenberg and David Lynch movies, all the fucked up movies. When I was a kid, the highest honor you can give a movie, it wasn't like four stars or thumbs up. You would be like, that's fucked up. I saw this movie. It was so fucked up. And I always dreamed about making a fucked up movie, but I never did. Like, Clerks is not a fucked up movie. It's funny. Mallrats, not fucked up. Chasing Amy, they're not fucked up movies. Like, Donnie Darko is a fucked up movie. So, like, you know, I remember Richard and made his right off the bat. Fucked up movie, first out the gate. Edgar Wright, Shaun of the Dead. That's a funny movie, but it's also that's a fucked up movie. And I never made one of those with all the... Even Dogma, it was a weird movie, but it was not a fucked up movie. 
So I always wanted to make that fucked up movie, and Red State wound up being that flick. So I figure I can kind of get in there and put in a little humor, but actually go in the other direction. And I learned that if you can make people laugh, you can also fucking spook them. It's very close. It's not that different from provoking laughter to provoking a startle or something like that. And I don't like to go for the boo shit. You know, it's not just like here's a cat jumping out of nowhere. I don't. I'm not good at that anyway. What I like to do is unnerving shit, where you're just like, oh, this is creepy. Um, there's a lot of that in Red State. There's way more in, in Tusk. But Tusk is funnier than Red State. Red State had some humor to it, but it was very took itself very seriously. Uh, Tusk. Uh, there's a lot of humor in it. There's a lot of funny things in it. The performances are funny, but it is madness. It is absolute madness. Whereas Red State was like me trying to make a thriller. Uh, Tusk was me trying to make a monster movie, but instead we just made a little madhouse, a 90 minute madhouse. That 20 minutes into the movie, we take a turn and never fucking go back. And you, you there's nothing to grab onto. It's just like Alice falling, falling. So I don't know. I, I, that to me is a thrill to pull off because 20 years ago I could never do that like 20 years ago I could do Clerks you saw that but like I could never make something like Tusk so 20 years on to be able to put something together where I'm like this is a fucked up movie it's a movie I would have watched when I was a kid that felt like an accomplishment to me so you know it's I didn't leave comedy behind totally but at the same time it felt nice to step away Clerks 3 very much a comedy so when we do that very much a comedy and also the one we're doing next, Yoga Hosers, is pretty funny as well, although it has horror elements in it. There's three movies I want to make in is set in Canada, that two more to follow, Tusk. There's Tusk, then there's Yoga Hosers, and then there's a movie called Moose Jaws, which is just Jaws with a moose. And um, it's called the True North Trilogy. So now we're, we're going to start the second one in August, I think. Okay. And you were satisfied with this? Yeah, I was, man. I was very satisfied. Uh, some cats weren't, but, you know, fuck, you can't please everybody. I was happy, though, because I, I felt like, oh, shit, I didn't know I could do that. Like, I hoped I could, but I didn't know I could pull it off. And I felt like me and Dave Klein, who's my DP on Red State, like, pulled off a magic trick. Movie looked way better than anything we'd ever done. So I was hoping Dave would come back for Red State, uh, for uh, Tusk, but he was working on that TV show Homeland. So instead, we got this DP named James Laxton, who did such an amazing job. And early in my career, like the DP was like a second thought to me. Just like, oh yeah, somebody's gonna take the pictures, right? While all my characters talk. But now, you know, 20 years in, you become, I, I can't help but become a little better at the job. Now there's much, uh, much deeper connection to the DP because it is about telling stories visually. Even if you're just showing people talking, there's still a visual way to do it, a cinematic way to do it. And I think I've kind of found, hit my stride finally. So yeah, I love them. I love looking at Red State, I love looking at Tusk, and I love watching them both because they're so fucked up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, go back to the indie thing. Mm -hmm. You are known to be one of the most famous indie directors in the USA. What do you think about the changes in the industry right now? The fact that you can put a story on the web and people crowdfunding it? or or the fact a, that this is not for theaters anymore. To me, it's it's so much better because if the idea is to to uh, make stories and tell your stories, then the easiest and quickest way to get those stories to the public should be of paramount importance to you. But if your idea of of filmmaking is what happened to me or Robert Rodriguez or Quentin, where we got lucky, we they we didn't have stars in our movies, so. Uh, Harvey Weinstein, or in the case of Robert Rodriguez, Columbia Pictures at that time with El Mariachi, push us forward to talk about the flicks. So we became personalities. Um, we became not the stars of the movie, but since we were out there going, hey, you guys see this movie I made? It's a little black and white movie set in a convenience store. We made it for $27,000. You know, people knew who we were more so than a generation of filmmakers before us. Like, can't not know the big ones like Spielberg, uh, Scorsese, like you'll see them in pictures from time to time. But generally speaking, prior to Miramax, directors weren't that well known. Only Cine East knew directors' names, but in the mainstream, they didn't know who the director was or really what the director did. But thanks to Miramax, they pushed all the directors out there, and so the directors became kind of rock stars, you know, for, to, for, for lack of a better expression, because you were advocating for your movie and trying to do it as entertainingly as possible. And since the movies were predicated on your personality, you going out there was kind of one and the same. So because of that, man, because they kind of pushed me forward, I got to be that guy, that very 
public filmmaker and whatnot. And also I had the Cinderella story, which doesn't really happen that much anymore, where like I went to Sundance, obscure, like nobody knew that movie or anything. And then by the end of the festival, I had a the movie picked up and they were going to fly me to Hollywood and shit like that. That doesn't happen so much anymore because going into the festival, all these films are tracked so heavily by uh, people who are looking to buy them and just by the media in general that by the time you get there, there are really no surprises anymore. It's tough to be a surprise film at a film festival, one that is, is also looking for distribution. So that world is gone. Like anybody that's like, I want to do it the way you did it, meaning me, or Robert, or Quentin, or Spike Lee, like that's, those days are over. The idea of like, I made this movie and it's, it's uh, got picked up at Sundance and now um, they gave me a three picture deal. Just doesn't really work that way anymore. Good news is the way it does work is way easier to do than it was for us back in the day. You know, it was way more pricey. Like Clerks as the first film looks like shit, cost too much money by today's standards. $27,000, $27,575. You can make five mumblecore movies for that kind of money these days. Especially when you consider Clerks is no more than people sitting around talking and sh shooting talk is cheap. So the technology is such that, man, you can shoot Clerks today probably for like less than a thousand bucks, be the same exact movie, actually look way better. So, you know, at that point, the technology and the distribution networks, the way they are back in my day or how, when I got in, you know, you hoped uh, Miramax would buy it or Sony Pictures Classics or New Line um, or, uh, let me see, a lot of October films, they're gone. Um, all these different companies, these distribution outlets, art house market uh, outlets, they've all either been absorbed by like, you know, Param everyone had their own classics division at one point. Um, Paramount Vantage went away, Miramax went away, came back, and now it's a different company. So it's all different in, in terms of uh, the players in the game when I first got in. But now you don't even need the players. Now you can do something like in the States, they have this thing called Tug, where you know you sign up on this website, you got yourself a movie, let's say you've got your own movie, you want a four wallet. You get 50 people to say they want to see it in the theater, boom, it goes to that theater. Like, it's crazy. You can get your movie distributed. People can see your movie now. There are a bunch of filmmakers from 1994 who I went to a few film festivals with. You never heard of them and never saw their movies, and they spent just as much time, if not more, and more money than we did on Clerks. That doesn't really happen anymore, because now people can always find some place to put the movie. If at the last fucking case scenario, you're like, look, I don't give a shit. I just want it seen. You put it right out up on YouTube, man, and people will watch it for free. We didn't have that luxury back in the day. It was like either you sold your movie to somebody or you four-walled it and schlepped it around yourself. Now it's just a different beast, and it's easier to get the stuff seen, but the, the whole, like, you have been plucked from obscurity, and now you are in the movie business doesn't happen nearly as much anymore, sadly. You write uh, a Georgia Ville, the Marvel Night, with Joe Quesada. Mm -hmm. What is your remember of the comics? Uh, I remember Joe Quesada asking me, because, you know, uh, the he and Jimmy Palmiotti had drawn... Uh, the Jay and Silent Bob cover for the Mallrats credits. So if you look for the look at the credits in Mallrats, the the Jay and Silent Bob comic book was drawn by Joe and has his character Ash in the background. So I met Joe and Jimmy right around Mallrats, 1995. So they wind up getting uh, their Marvel Knights deal like 97 or something like that, and I'd known them for a couple of years at this point. They had been in Chasing Amy as well at the fake Comic Con at the end. You see the boys sitting there. So I was friendly with them, and they called me and said, we just got these titles from Marvel. Like, Marvel let us take a few titles that we're going to publish ourselves. I said, get out of here. On your, at your label, they had event comics. But they're like, no, we're doing it within Marvel. We're subcontracting. And one of the titles we have is Daredevil. And I know you love Daredevil, so do you want to write it? And I said, yes, in a heartbeat, I want to write Daredevil. Please, please, please. And so a week later, I called up Jimmy and Joe, and I was like, you know what, man, I'm, I don't think I'm gonna do this. And they were like, why? First I called Joe, and Joe goes, why? And I said, honestly, Joe, like, I'm getting nauseous just thinking of having to fill Frank Miller's shoes. Frank Miller wrote some of the best fucking Daredevil this planet has ever seen, some of the best superhero writing ever was in his Daredevil ride. So I was like, I can't. If I put my fucking foot in those waters, I'm going to look like the rank amateur I am. I got no business touching that character. So Joe was very good about it. He's like, I understand. He's going, I think you could do it. But like, look, if you don't feel it, you don't feel it. 
So uh, he hung up, like in a nice way. Then Jimmy Palmiotti, his inker at the time, his friend, the guy that they ran the business together, uh, he called me up and he was like, you're a fucking pussy. Like, Joe was good cop. Jimmy was bad cop. He's like, you fucking suck, dude. You said you were going to do this, and you got everyone excited, and now you're backing off because you don't think you're as good as Frank Miller. What kind of pussy bullshit is that? Why don't you step up and fucking do this? And I was like, I don't know. I don't have a story in me, Jimmy. He's just like, that's horse shit, man. You really let Joe down. He hung up, and I felt fucking bad. So I thought about it for like an hour, and I called him up, and I was like, I think I have a story, man. Can I? Is it still too late? Or they said, no, come on, let's do it. So... It was, first I was in, then I was out, then I was in wholeheartedly. And then I had to learn how to write a comic book, which I had never done Marvel style before. So the first script of uh, Daredevil is very spare. Maybe it's a page long, and it's more a description of the entire uh, uh, issue, more of a synopsis, if you will. So Joe went and drew uh, all the pages, and then I went and Marvel method style dialogued afterwards you know the general I didn't give him a bunch of dialogue and so he didn't leave me a lot of room for balloons and stuff and I would tend to write a bunch so we learned each other's style over the course of issue one and two issue two was more of a script but still not full script it wasn't until issue three that I went full script and I was describing what I needed to see in each panel so by issue three I was writing a comic the way I prefer to write a comic DC method Issue one was flat out Marvel method where I was like, these are the beats of the story. You as the artist, go direct it. And Joe Quesada is an amazing director. If Joe Quesada doesn't get in front of a camera one day, it's a fucking crime because his Daredevil book is exquisite. The only reason people know my Daredevil run is because his artwork is so cinematic. He, I had this one page of Matt and Karen and Beth. Fuck, it wasn't one page. It was four pages of dialogue. Matt and Karen talking to each other. And Joe was just like, Kevin, like, it's just two people in bed in a comic book for four pages. Like, can I play with it a little bit? I was like, as long as you don't lose any of my dialogue, it's fine. And he drew that wonderful page where it starts in the corner here and goes down to the corner here. And it's all this boxes and all these board balloons in between elegantly told the story. So what I remember from that run specifically was what a great director Joe Casada was. Um, and then the book came out and it gave me great credibility in the comic book community more than I'd had prior to that because I was writing a comic book for one of the big two. And Joe points it out, he's like, nobody was doing that at that time. Hollywood wasn't involved in comics. I always like to shout out Jeff Loeb, because Jeff Loeb made uh, Commando. He wrote Commando, this Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. And then a couple years later, he wrote a miniseries for DC called The Challengers of the Unknown. He was the first filmmaker to comic book writer, going backwards. Most people are like, I want to be a comic book writer and eventually make movies. He was the one guy to go back. And so I remember seeing that. So years later, when Clerks happened and Mallrats happened, I reached out to them and said, like, I would like to write comic books. And because I came from movies, it made it a little sexier, or a little easier or something like that. So Joe Quesada is always like, you were the first one to come over from Hollywood. Now a bunch of fucking filmmakers make comic books and shit. But back in 97, that wasn't the case. But it wasn't me, honestly. It was Jeff Loeb. He was the first one. The guy who had had a job long before I did. He made, you know, Commando was a mainstream movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger and shit like that. And still, the guy went to comic books. At a time when I'm sure everyone, his agent and the business was like, why are you writing these fucking funny books? Because that's the attitude I got. When I was told my agent, I was like, I'm going to write Daredevil for Marvel Comics. He's like, what the fuck's that pay? A hundred bucks a page? And I was like... You don't get it, dude. I'm going to write Daredevil. For my, who the fuck cares what it pays? I'd pay them. Like, this is an honor. So now that's kind of what it is. Like, everybody comes from, from our side of the pond into the world of comics. They're all are welcome kind of thing. Back in 97, 98, not so much. Um, so it feels good to have gotten in there early. Uh, and then, like, even before, you know, I, I was writing comics before Joss Whedon. And, uh, and Joss Whedon, of course, did better things after writing comics than I did. But it's nice to see a bunch of Hollywood people coming over at this point. Because why not? You know, like, it's, it's a medium we all loved. It fueled our imaginations as children. And just because you get paid big bucks to go direct movies don't mean you can't go play in the sandbox again. Particularly with these characters. Now these characters, like... I bet you there are a lot more constraints dealing with these characters than we ever had to deal with because all these characters at Marvel, they're owned by Disney. So some of the shit that we did in Daredevil probably wouldn't even get away with today. So it was a glorious time. I'm not going to say it was a golden age, but for me it was a personal golden age. And still stands as one of my 
best works according to most people. Like people still bring me that Daredevil book to come sign, either the single issues or the hardcover. And I always try to give credit where it's due, man. It was Casada, his vision. He was the guy that was like, I think Kevin would write a good story. And I didn't even believe in myself, but Joe believed in me. And he hedged his bets by making sure it was the most beautiful thing he's ever done in his life as well. And it bought him, and think, think about what it got him, an entire fucking career. It changed Joe Quesada's life. Now he's like head of Marvel Entertainment, you know? Like, from the guy who was drawing comic books to the guy that's running the, the comic book company. It's, I'm always very proud of him. Uh, just one other mm. question. Um, I love the Jersey movies. Thank and, you, um, me too. Uh, I would like to know uh, how you create your character, Silent Bob. What was the idea? Silent Bob wasn't even created for me. It was created for a guy named Mike Bellicose, who was okay. my best friend in, in school. <coughs> the idea was, I love Jay's character. Uh, he was based on Jason Mewes at that time when he was 16. When Jason Mewes was 16, that's pretty much who you see as the Jay character. Um, he was that guy that always talked about pussy until a woman stepped into his eyesight. Pussy, 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 and then... Pussy, 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 you know, that was this whole thing. So I took that character. I always said, like, God, somebody should put you in a movie. Long before I ever wanted to make movies, I was like, you'd be funny in a movie, man. I think, like, people would think, I wonder if people think you're as funny as we think you, you are in our town, and blah, blah, blah. So years later, I was like, you know what, I'm going to put him in that movie. When I was making the Clerks thing, I was like, I'm going to include Jay, because he is fucking a, such a character. And I didn't want to have him standing out there himself, by himself, just talking. He'd look insane. So I wanted somebody to stand next to him, um, but he didn't have to talk because Jay would do all the talking. So I figured, all right, he's a drug dealer, he needs some muscle, I'll put a bigger guy next to him and shit who's just quiet and that he's always talking to that guy. So it was written for my friend Mike Belkos, who was in Clerks as the guy who, uh, Dante goes, 37, my girlfriend sucked 37 dicks, and he goes, in a row? That was originally Silent Bob, that's who it was written for. Randall, I wrote for me to play. That's why Randall has all the best jokes. Because I was like, I'm going to be Randall. And then as we got close to production, I realized I couldn't work in the store, make the movie, and memorize all the dialogue. Like at one point, I had a little breakdown. I was like, there's too many words. Who wrote this shit? And they're like, you did. So I was like, fuck. So I looked for somebody else to play Randall. That was Jeff Anderson, a guy that I had gone to school with. And he hadn't been active in, in high school in acting or anything like that. But he was very funny in the back of the class, kind of like a class clown kind of guy. So he'd been coming into the video store, RST Video, where I was working at the time, renting movies because we had a better selection than the one near his house. And I told him about the movie. I said, we're going to have auditions at the First Avenue Playhouse. You should come down. And Jeff auditioned. He didn't even bring material. He auditioned as Jay. So he read Jay's part on the Clerks 10 DVD. You can see him auditioning as Jay. So once I saw Jeff reading, I was like, oh, that's your Randall, man. Like I, I'll make him Randall and let me see if there's anything left in the movie and maybe I can be in it too. And Silent Bob was already cast, you know, I'd given it to that guy, Mike, but he didn't give a shit. And I was just like, look, man, Silent Bob would be the best character for you to play because you're opposite of Jay. Jay's very tall and thin, stout and fucking wide and shit. Um, I liked wearing the, the, the coat anyway, so I was like, this would look cool in a movie, like this big coat and a backwards baseball cap and shit like that. And um, I didn't have to memorize any dialogue, best of all. I wouldn't have to memorize anything. <laughs> so I could just stand there. And it was going to make it easy to direct Jason. Jason was the most rank amateur of everybody in the cast. So I could stand next to him and be like, you're doing it wrong, snooch to the newt, and shit like that, and direct him side by side with him. And if you see, there's like the, one of the scenes, the Olaf, the Olaf scene with Olaf, Russian metal face and all that shit. I was so mad at him. Watch my face in that scene because he fucked up three times. And that's three takes on a black and white $27,000 movie. It's a lot of fucking money. So I got in this argument right, right before we went. I was like, get it fucking right this time. I don't have a lot of money and shit. Action. And so all of a sudden you watch him in that scene versus the rest of the movie. He's a little shitty at first. He's just like, I don't know, this guy's a character. Like he's almost like, I don't want to do this anymore because he got yelled at. But luckily he kind of stayed in there. So Silent Bob was just a way to be in the movie, not have to memorize dialogue, and direct Jay, be very in the action and direct Jay. Um, and it wound up being like the thing that defines my life where people will see me in the street and be like, Bob, and I wave even though it's not my name. <laughs> <laughs> But it's in terms of you know characters to be, like 
it's a it's a really good one. Nobody ever comes up to me and says, I find Silent Bob so offensive, you know, because he doesn't really say anything. And when he talks, it's kind of heartfelt. But Jay gets a lot of shit. You know, people are like, he's so offensive. I was like, isn't he? <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Pleasure, pleasure.